Okay, guys, can you hear me? Okay, good. Cool. <laughs> Hi. How you guys doing? Pretty good. You guys can use those little yes and no buttons too, if you want. Yes. I'm pretty good, Saeed. Oh, don't get sick. Man. Well, good thing you can't come to campus, Nikki. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, so yesterday was rough. I posted all three videos for work and energy without sound. So sorry about that. But I uh, managed to get them up by like, I don't know, midnight, 1230 last night. <clears throat> my Wi-Fi is so bad and I, I had to use a hotspot just to upload those and it took like two to two and a half hours each. So man, I got no Wi-Fi. <laughs> but hopefully some of you guys had a chance to look at them. Um, those were supposed to be the lectures for today to talk about. Um, and that is not material that's on the exam. So work and energy is new material. Um, on the next exam, our, our next exam, so I'll write that up here, work and energy and momentum, those are all on exam three, so that's all on the next exam. So for us, uh, we're just covering, remember, centripetal forces, gravitational forces, buoyancy forces, forces from pressure, all of those kind of extra forces. and including the basic Newton's law stuff with sum of forces and friction, that's all gonna be on our exam too. Um, on Tuesday, right, uh, in this kind of standard class session. So fortunately, we're all gonna be meeting one more time before the exam. We'll have our recitations, right, Monday and Tuesday. So that's good news because I feel like um, we're going to need it just to kind of clarify some some stuff. You know, we can make sure we work out any mechanics of working on the exam then, as well as kind of any last minute questions or questions about material because you guys really would have had a chance to dig in by then. So that will be nice. Um, so I have a question. Is there a spring break even in online classes? Yeah, there's a spring break. So. Um, that's still going to happen. So that's the week after next. So that's nice. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, really quickly, I'll just go over some of the stuff here. And then I, I really do want to talk about um, how the quiz went, and maybe find out how it went on your end. And then I'll talk about what it looks like on my end. Um, the number one is that the, the quiz solutions are posted if you want to take a look at them and they're in the same folder that that quiz was in. So you should just be able to see those just fine. Um, so please take a look at those. Um, there is a homework due tonight on the kind of Archimedes buoyancy stuff. And um, like I said, there's an exam on Tuesday in class. So kind of thinking about the quiz as a trial run for the exam. Um, you know, I'll, I'm just gonna let you guys know what it kind of looked like on my end, and then you guys can tell me what issues you had on your end. <clears throat> but for me, the way it worked is I instantly, um, everything was on private chat all of a sudden. And so in the first like five to 10 minutes and in the last five to 10 minutes, you guys, I had a lot of questions um, just dealing with not being able to find the quiz, um, not being able to upload the quiz, just issues with those kind of things. So I just want you guys to be aware of that. And it's really hard to answer a lot of private messages because I have to kind of backtrack and see. So if we're in that situation again, uh, please just be patient with me because I'm just kind of doing the best I can. And it's, it is kind of like overwhelming. I wish you could see it on my end. And then after that, it was like almost like radio silent, just the occasional question. So that was okay. Um, after kind of looking through a few of the quizzes, I haven't started grading them yet because I, I had to re-record all those videos yesterday, so I was kind of in that mode. But looking at them briefly, um, what I realized right away is that what's not going to work for me is the photo submission. So 
for the exam, I'm going to say you absolutely cannot submit a photo as an assignment. You know, I can't look at like eight to 10 pages of something like that. Um, there's just no way the resolution is poor. And, um, you know, there's no way I can take a photo submission. So you guys need to find another way before Tuesday, because this isn't going to be a good situation if you guys aren't prepared. You know, we, we've had a trial run now. So I feel like you guys should know what's expected of you and what the problem is going to be, um, the problems that you can anticipate with uh, uploading and printing and scanning. So if you haven't gotten some kind of app that does this, don't forget there's Genius Scan and Cam Scan. I'm sure there's, you know, or just, you know, if you're smart, buy a printer scanner. Um, I think Cam Scan, it comes out better. Like a regular photo is really horrible in terms of lighting and um, I'm pretty sure, I don't know, I don't know, I haven't used Cam Scanner yet. I've only really looked at Genius Scan. Genius Scan was pretty good because it lets me do multiple pages in sequence. Um, sometimes it doesn't turn out great. So you really should leave like the 15 minutes. Like I'm giving you, I'm going to give you guys another 15 minutes for the exam. So we're going to have an hour and 20 minute exam. And then I'm going to give you an extra 15 minutes for an hour and 35 minutes on top of that. And I really want you guys to reserve that 15 minutes for dealing with these issues. Um, I'm going to ask that you print out, please print out, print out the exam. I'm going to put that on here too. Uh, blank pieces of paper. I don't know. Um, you know, if you're in a complete jam um, and something happens, please use blank pieces of paper instead of nothing. Do you know what I mean? But like it's hard enough for me, like some people, some people uploaded individual pages. So I had like five individual JPEGs or something like that where they were all out of order and I couldn't tell which one was in which order. And I'm like looking at them and their poor resolution and, you know, just to grade that thing for one quiz, right, is going to be a nightmare for me. Just trying to figure out what somebody kind of uploaded. So you guys need to think about like what I'm getting. I'm getting 70 exams online, which means that um, I'm getting 70 exams online, which means that they better look good and they better be, you know, in one file if, if you can help it. I don't think tablet screenshots are the same as a photo, right, Lebic? I, you know, I, I actually don't know what they look like on your end, but whatever upload you upload to me needs to look good and be one file, ideally. All right, so um, that's what's happening. You know, honestly, Danielle, I don't know. You're going to have to use your best bet. Um, yeah, if you can write on the iPad, that works because you can just save those documents as PDFs and upload them, right? Um, in fact, that's way better. I mean, if you feel the need to invest in some kind of tablet with a writing mechanism, um, <laughs> you know, I think it's worthwhile. At the very least, maybe having a printer scanner around to deal with these things, you know, because come exam day Tuesday, I, I'm not going to be lenient again, because this is the other thing that happened. So there was a bunch of people that um, from about 12 o'clock, I, I had somebody submit it 12 hours late, you guys, <laughs> 12 hours late, something like that, eight hours late, people submitted the quiz. Um, for various reasons, they, you know, most people were in the first zero to 15 minutes after the quiz, they were still trying to submit the quiz. Some people like 20, 30 minutes later were submitting it. And what am I supposed to do with that situation? Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, so, so yeah, there I am. Um, so I'm going to be penalizing for any, oh God, I wrote late labs on here. Late exams are now going to be penalized 1% point for each minute late for the first 15 minutes. And then after that, it's going to be 5% per minute. All right, so I know that seems super strict, but you have to understand that if I give somebody 30 extra minutes to do an exam, how fair is that for the rest of the class? Do you know what I mean? I'm already giving you 15 minutes extra to figure out the uploading and downloading process. You know, so even worst case scenario, that's too much time. I'm, I'm not giving you 15 extra minutes just to work on the exam. That's just for the process of figuring out how to do things. So. You guys, please 
be sure that you know what you're doing. Otherwise, I'm really just going to penalize you guys for it because I can't be in that situation again. It's just too unfair to everyone else involved. So um, please make note of this. And um, people cannot turn these in late just because we're not here. Okay, guys. Um, late, labs, late labs are the same policy as usual, just 10% per day, except for weekends. It, that's all the same. You have an hour and 20 minutes for the exam. Right, so it's our class time from 11 to 12.20. And then after that, I'm going to give you 15 extra minutes. 15 extra minutes for dealing with this stuff that we have to deal with now. And so it's going to be due at 12.35 PM. Now, a lot of people, um, like I said last time, it was due at 12. Um, and actually, it at 11.59 and 59 seconds, it cut it off as late. So if you were one minute late, because you turned it in at 12, for example, I'm not going to count that as late, because I said 12. And just like I'm saying 12.35, if you're in that one minute, um, that's OK. So yeah, so just like before, um, that there's an extra 15 minutes incorporated into that deadline. You know What you see on Canvas as is the deadline. That's absolutely the deadline for getting everything uploaded in a decent way. OK, so if you submit photos to me, um, not accepting it, find a better way to turn it in. Just try to be kind of considerate of what's happening on my end, you know, so you can, you can think about those things. OK, let me just scroll back and see if I missed anything here. Um, Yeah, Patrick, you're going to be penalized for that. I'm, I'm going to penalize a half a point per minute. So if you're 15 minutes late, I'm going to take off seven and a half. That's, that's what I'm going to do for the quiz. Half a point per minute, period. Um, you know, maybe with some exceptions. I don't know. I, you know, what's hard for me to understand, Patrick, is that I don't know if you were still working on the quiz or not working on the quiz. And these are conversations for us to have personally a different time maybe not here with everyone else, but it's hard for me to kind of know when people stopped working. Um, you know, you guys can also have timers, you know, you can set timers to go off to remind yourselves, you know, because we're not in a class setting, you might consider doing that. I mean, I can give more reminders. Um, I can give more reminders like 15 yeah, I'll definitely do that. Well, I can set an alarm and say, we have 15 minutes left. Um, please make sure you're uploading. And then five minutes remaining. Omar, when you say upload the test as one big file, um, well, if you scan it as one big file, then that's it. You just upload it as that file. Um, that's it. And uh, if you are doing it on CamScan or GeniusScan, I know GeniusScan lets you scan all of as one file. So you should be able to do that too um, in sequence. So, I mean, unless you're taking individual pictures and uploading those, which again, I'm not accepting, um, you shouldn't have a problem. Most, most scanners, however, whatever form they come in, scan as one file. So please just practice doing it, you guys practice. Uh, don't just leave it to the last minute. Would uploading PNGs a zip file work better? PNGs are just image files, right? Uh, Kyle, are there just pictures again, just photos with a phone or? Yeah, and I, I don't know what a zip file looks like on my end, to be perfectly honest, either. Oh, so. Uh, I don't know. As long as it comes out clear, uh, you can always take a PNG and print it to PDF. Do you know what I mean? As one file. Uh, that might be, a, a, it might not even be a smaller amount of uh, data to upload. Yeah. Genius scan is weird. I, I was, I used it today to, um, it's not, it's not perfect every time. Sometimes I have to take photos a couple of times to get it to look good. Um, the way that it works, 
it's all about lighting. You guys need to practice this. Just practice and see what works the best. It sounds like Adobe Scan works well. Um, maybe just try different things, but try it before Tuesday, you guys. Um, also, you know, please go to that. Um, <clears throat> you know, you guys can discuss this too in the Discord server, right? That's an option. Like maybe as you find things that work very well, um, that would be a good idea to do. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, because we're still talking about centripetal forces uh, equals MA centripetal, that stuff is definitely on the test. Okay. Honestly, I recommend just buying a printer <laughs> that scans. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know it's 100 bucks, but maybe your parents will loan you some cash. I don't know. Like to me, that's the easier kind of best case scenario. It takes a little while. Yeah. Yeah, maybe printers can suck. So have a backup plan. I don't know. Um, chapters on the exam, that's a really fair question. Uh, let me get my book. Hold on, Nikki. Okay, so um, looking at the book, these are the chapters that kind of covers what's on the exam. Um, but, uh, you know, that's kind of a skeleton of what's on the exam because we've done a lot more in kind of more difficult situations together, especially with gravitational fields and buoyancy forces. I feel like we've just kind of done a bit more than what's in the book. So um, please, again, refer to all of our notes and that kind of book of notes that I have for you guys is kind of studying material too, because I feel like, uh, although it's important to look at the book, so uh, this is from the, our textbook. Um, it's important to look at it. Yeah, so gravitational fields, forces, buoyancy forces, forces from pressure as well as centripetal acceleration and forces, you know, but also included in this is kind of everything we did before in kind of chapter five on forces is still kind of the stepping stone for this, right? So we're still kind of expected to work all of that chapter five material too in here. But I like to think about this whole exam as just kind of one big forces exam. 
you know, extra forces. <laughs> like we did Newton's law and now these are like other forces, but we're really still working with forces on some level or another. But yeah, gravitational fields, buoyancy forces, forces with circular motion and forces from pressure. That's kind of the, kind of the list. All right, so um, sum of forces equals ma centripetal. Um, gravitational field, which is this also gravitational force. Um, also forces from pressure. Understanding how pressure varies with depth and all of those things, pressure in general. Um, in addition to that, uh, buoyancy forces. And kind of whatever we've covered in that material. Um, yeah. You feel stupid after looking at the quiz solutions. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, did I, I, what I feel like is what's going to happen is people are going to make a lot of assumptions that uh, you were, should have been proving. But I'm hoping that at least if you make the right assumptions, then at least you're working the right problem. I don't feel stupid anyhow, you guys. This, this, I feel like this gravitational stuff is actually really hard. You know, I think it's pretty hard. But it's nice, what it's preparing you for is in 210, literally the first thing that we study for is electric fields, which is just the same as this gravitational field stuff, but with, instead of just attractive forces, we have repulsive and attractive. So this is really setting you up to be in a good place for 210. You just can't forget things over the summer. <laughs> so if I were you guys, before you start 210 next to semester, I would kind of go back to that gravitational field stuff and, and remember it. You know, you're saying, oh no, is that about the electric fields? Yeah, it's so fun though, you'll see. Because then we get to do Gauss's law and all bunch of cool stuff. I like electric fields too, and magnetic fields. <laughs> Okay, let me go back to my, uh, in theory, I am teaching 210 in the fall. So I'm so excited about that. Yeah, we're talking about electric fields from 210. Hmm. Well, things just change around here. So I was gonna be 205 for another year and now I'm 210. So I'm just waiting to see, am I really teaching 210? I don't know. So that's what I mean in theory. All right, let me just make sure I've said everything I need to say. Oh, um, so yeah, just backing up a little bit. Um, I will be posting practice exam solutions today. So you don't have to look at them yet um, if you don't want to, but they'll be posted today. And uh, my office hour today is gonna be by email only. So when we're done here, I'm just, I'm gonna jet home. I just have so much work to do. And um, I want to kind of, if today I can start grading the extra credit and the quiz, uh, I'd be in a good place to start writing the exam tomorrow. And so I'm anticipating writing the exam uh, over the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, are there any questions about this kind of uh, business stuff that we're talking about? Any more business questions before we go into other questions? Okay. So, um, yeah, I can go over homework questions. Are there any other kind of questions that you guys have? Who here has two tests on Tuesday? Uh, can you guys just go to those yes and no buttons and press it? Press yes if you have a test Tuesday, two tests Tuesday and press no if you don't. Do you guys know where those are? I like that, I wanna see it. I've only got like eight people answering. Oh, here we go, 15. There's 44 of you, come on. Yes or no, find those yes or no buttons. Oh. You guys are saying no. Under participants, yeah, I guess there's a participants tab. 
I'll look at the participants view and then you have yes and no, go slower, go faster. Okay, so the majority of you right now, it's, it's 10 yeses to 22 noes is what I'm seeing right here. 10 yeses to 23 noes. So most of you guys are pretty good on Tuesday. Okay, I'm gonna clear that. And then you guys tell me how many of you have an exam on Thursday? Say yes if you have an exam, no if you have an exam, if you don't have an exam. <laughs> Oh, my yes is. Oh, I put yes. <laughs> hmm. For the two of you who say you have an exam on Thursday, is it a hard exam? I'm cl clearing it. So just for the two of you that said yes, you have an exam on Thursday, is it hard exam? Yes or no? Okay. Okay, then. Okay, um, all right, so I was just taking a poll to see if uh, it was worthwhile for me to try to change things, but um, I've already said it's Tuesday, so that's, that's what we're doing, exam on Tuesday. So hey, um, let's work on other stuff. So what homework questions or basic other questions do you guys have for me? Let me say that, Nikki. I just think about you with a laser gun. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Question 10B and C from fluids. All right, let me look at that. Oh, I have it open. Is that the swimming pool one? All of 10. Okay. All right, so 10 on the homework says that you have a swimming. Uh, interesting thing, just really quickly about Elia, about centripetal force is that um, it doesn't do any work at all. So I find this just fascinating. So let me just answer that really question and then I'll do number 10. <laughs> um, make sure I can still. So. So if you have something in moving in circular motion, um, you have a little infinitesimal displacement vector dr as you move around the circle, right? Because you're moving in circular motion. And then let's say you have some kind of net force, a force centripetal pointing radially inward. Because they're perpendicular with respect to one another, the work done by a centripetal pointing force for something moving in a circle is in fact zero. Crazy. Um, so that always blows my mind, but if you think about it, it makes sense because you say that there's one energy level for being in circular motion, right? And then a different energy associated with a different radius, but it doesn't cost energy to actually move around the circle itself, right? That's energy free. It blows my mind. Uh, exactly. It's, it's, it's all kind of there. Like there's, there is no energy associated with the circular motion like that because of that perpendicular nature. Of course, that would be different if you had some kind of tangential force, right? And then there would be energy put in or out of the system. And then you could ask questions about it being conservative or not. Okay, so let me just erase that. <laughs> that was a sidetrack. That's such an interesting sidetrack. It blows my mind. Doesn't it? <laughs> All right, uh, let me go look at that problem again, number 10. Now it says, I have a swimming pool with dimensions blank and blank. Oh, I don't know how you're supposed to assume which one of those is length and which one is width. So you have a swimming pool. Oh, I see. Um, and it has a depth of D. Um, my D is like 2.5. And then uh, one of these, 
I don't know, is width and one of these is length. Okay, I, I don't know which one, but they're all knowns. W, L, and D are known. And um, this swimming pool is completely filled at this point with uh, fresh water. So you can think about it as being completely filled with fresh water. And it says, what is the force exerted by the water on the, the bottom? And then it says, what is the force exerted on each end? Oh, and then it says the ends are eight meters and then the sides are 36 meters. Okay, so either by W or L. So let me see. So the ends for them, they, they represent in the problem, they say it has dimensions of side by end. Huh. And so for me, mine were like 36.0 by 8.0. And then depth was its own thing. Okay, so for part A, it says, what is the force exerted by the water on the bottom? What is the force on the bottom of the pool itself? So uh, remember so, uh, the, way that we, the way that we think about that, I'm gonna mute you. Or, the way that we think about that is, um, um, we wanna kind of think about what does pressure look like? Remember it's in these kind of horizontal layers. So, you know, because I have this three dimensional graph, I can draw it this way. So each, Kind of horizontal plane is one of constant pressure right and um, that's true for this very last one here which is the bottom so because it's constant pressure when i write force equals to integral pda the pressure comes out of the integral and i can just write the force as pressure times area in this case and so on the bottom and let me go ahead and cut that picture out actually. Oops, what is happening? So uh, on the bottom, I know that the, the area of the bottom it's just what I'm calling width, width times length right here, or side times end is what they called it. It's fine. And um, so this is, I guess, side and this is end. And so I can find the area. So I just need to find what is the pressure at the bottom in order to find the force, which is just gonna be force at the bottom since it's constant pressure is pressure times area. And pressure, remember, is just a function of height. Or, excuse me, I should write that as a y, um, where we're measuring y kind of positively downward. And so uh, for me, this would give me the pressure at the bottom would be pressure two. I need a reference pressure. So you got to assume that this is open to the atmosphere. And for a lot of these kind of problems, you have to assume that you're at atmospheric pressure. And we write that as P naught. So P naught would be one ATM or in the correct units for us, 101.3 kilopascals, which really we should write as 101, 300 pascals. Um, plus rho, which is here the density of fresh water, which is gonna be a thousand kilograms per meters cubed times g times the depth with respect to that reference point. So since our reference point is right here at the top, the depth with respect to that point is just d. And so pressure at the bottom will equal to 101, 300 plus 1,000 times 9.8, 9,800 times whatever your distance d is that you're given. And that pressure times area that will be the force at the bottom
Mm. Yeah, I know what you mean. I told you those, those kind of questions are just uh, subtle, but it said, oh, yeah, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Andrew and Mark, I, I don't know if that's, you know, I see where you're going with this because that last problem, that's what it says. But um, I'm going to assume for now that most of the time you really do include the atmospheric pressure. But if you didn't, um, if this was one of those cases, you would just let this go to zero. Um, and you would just be looking at the pressure without it. Okay, so then that is the case. If it's if it, they're saying it's just from the water, so um, in fact we would be then looking at a gauge pressure P two minus P one equal to rho G Y. Yeah, I really hate when they do that. <laughs> it always takes me by surprise. So they are saying just from the water, so not including the atmosphere above. Okay, so yeah. Um, part B on this problem oops, is now saying, what is the force exerted on each end? The force on each end. And they're the same because everything is very symmetric here. And it is the force by the water on each end. So I am also going to be neglecting atmospheric pressure. And so I'm going to just highlight an end right here. Right Here's an end. So there's my end. And this time, pressure is not constant over a little infinitesimal area. And um, I mean, over the whole area. And I know that because pressure varies with depth, right? In general, we think about this equation for how pressure varies with depth. And so I know over this whole little end right here that the pressure is not constant, but it is constant in those lines across the area, right? So um, what I can think about this as is, okay, pressure, and I am gonna use a gauge pressure uh, like this, a uh, pressure for part B will just be uh, literally rho G times Y. This will be the density of water. That will be the gravitational constant. And this Y will be measured from the top down. Um, as I kind of show you guys here, remember it's really measured from the top down in this case for this equation. Um, and so, um, what I'm going to try to do now is to find the infinitesimal area associated with one of these little constant pressure lines right here. And then uh, thinking about it that way, here's that end. Here's one of those little lines, kind of a constant pressure. Now it's going to have a width of L and a height of dy like that. So I'm going to represent my d area vector as L dy. And when I'm plugging both of these into my integral, the force on the end, I'll be careful of what my limits are, but I'll have density of water g y L dy. Uh, I'll pull out all my constants. This is really the integral of y dy. And I'm going to be integrating from zero down to depth D. And so the force on one of the ends, which is again symmetric, will end up being density of water G L um, times one half D squared. And these are all values that you have. And so once you do Oh, y squared, but evaluated between zero and D, the depth. And once you do this one, um, doing one of the sides is the same as doing one of the ends. It's just your D area vector changes, honestly. So for part C, let me just kind of cut this out again.
for part C, you're finding the kind of force on one of the sides now. So everything is the same as what you've done before. Oh, Diego, it has to do with the wording. They, they use that wording again, just from the water. It's such a subtle little point. Um, but when they say that, they want to know with neglecting atmospheric pressure just from the water. So it's almost like saying, when I added the water, how much additional force is there? Because maybe you knew how much, you knew maybe that your swimming pool was stable without air, but you want to know how much just water you can add, kind of subtracting out a, you know, atmospheric pressure. And maybe it's negligible, honestly. But, but that's why it's when they use these words, you know, they're indicating to neglect kind of the reference pressure, the atmospheric pressure. Is that good, Diego? Okay. So to work part C, like I said, we're now finding uh, the force on just one of these sides right here. And so I'm going to do the same thing I did before. Pressure is going to be rho g y this is the density of water but my d area vector is going to be a little bit different now because i'll be focusing now just on one of these little d areas one of these d areas and so it's also going to have a thickness of dy but a width of w so this is going to be w dy now and when I perform the integration to find the force on one of the sides, like I said, it's real similar. Also integrating from zero to D, this is density of water. It's the same up to this value of W, where here it was L. Okay, so they're literally the same answer, just with that variation. And that should make sense because pressure is actually varying in the same, you know, along these lines in the same way, right, on both of them. The only difference is associated with the width of the actual side versus end that you're looking at. Okay. Any other questions, you guys? You guys should all show me yourselves just for one second. All right, number six, but you got to show me yourselves just for one second. Unless you're like, you know, in some serious physiognomy. <laughs> hey, what's up, Daniel? <laughs> I only got one. No, man. You guys, you got to show me yourselves if I'm going to do problems. Go on, just show me video real quick. I don't have a webcam. Ah, <laughs> I got two. All right. Come on. I need like two more and then I'll do it. Come on. Two more. Two more faces. Hey, Adrian. <laughs> All right. One more. Oh, I got Jesse. Yay. <laughs> Lopez. So nice. Thank you guys. Good to see you. Okay. All right. That's good. I don't know, you should, on video link, maybe. Okay, don't worry about it, I'm good. I just had to see a face. <laughs> oh God, I'm going crazy, you guys. Man. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're talking about number five and number six. Is that what I saw here? Number six and number five. Um, I, I know I did one on the last, let me take a look. Oh, I didn't do those. Okay, so the one I did with you guys was actually number one. That was a hard one. That was last time. So number five and number six. Okay. Oops. <laughs> All right, so number five, the gravitational force exerted on a solid object is blank. When the object is suspended from a spring scale and submerged in water, the scale reads blank. Find the density of the object. Oh, this is like the lab. So, um, you know, in the Archimedes lab, 
we have the mass of the object. Uh, so here's a scale and it's in air. And we also had the mass of an object when it was submerged in a fluid. Um, yeah, let's submerge it in, looks like water on this problem. Um, remember, we called this the buoyant mass, and this is the mass of the object. Now, part of what you're deriving is this relationship that you get for the density of the object, which is equal to the density of the water times the mass of the object in air divided by the difference between the mass of the object minus the buoyant mass. So you should be able to just use, <laughs> oh my God, Kyle, it's <laughs> funny. Okay, so um, you should just be able to use this equation to get the right answer. How you derive that equation, I mean, honestly, it's still just sum of forces. So if you want to derive this thing, um, if I were you, I would just start playing around with doing um, force body diagram on both of these pictures. Here you have tension, the weight of the object. Here you have a different tension because the spring scale is reading something else. You still have the weight of the object, but now you have a buoyancy force. Um, and you can start messing around with these. Um, the tension in the string, and kind of maybe the hint of this is that tension in the string is just the, the reading of the scale, the buoyant force times G. And if you play around with these, you should be able to derive this equation. You know, a lot of this is replacing masses with um, densities and volumes and buoyancy force. Oh yeah, that was in the Archimedes lab. So you should have looked at that by now. <laughs> yeah, that sucks, but you need that equation for the lab and uh, you should work on deriving it kind of with those hints I just gave you. And, um, and then you should be able to use it and move forward. So I do like that question because it is a little lab, effectively. So let me now look at number six. Number six. It says that you have a beaker with a certain mass. Here's your beaker. And it contains oil. Um, and the mass of the oil is equal to M1, is what they're calling it. And the density of the oil is density one. And a block of iron of mass two and density two is submerged, so here's the iron, in the oil and it's attached to like a scale. It's completely submerged. It says determine the equilibrium readings of both scales. I'm not exactly sure which one T1 and T2 are supposed to be. Uh, you can use any of the symbols that they give you along with G, but there's a scale under here too, so I should draw that. There's also kind of a scale under here. So uh, maybe one is, I don't know if this is true, but maybe this one is reading what they call T1 and this one is T2. So uh, let's see if we can figure this out. Um, I'm going to start with T1. So in theory, what that scale should be reading is the buoyant mass, right, of an object. Um, and so let me just start by doing a force body diagram on the iron. That's going to help me. Here's the iron. And um, just so you guys know, I might be totally wrong. This one might be T1 and this T2 and this one might be T1. If so I'll flip them around um, at the end. But here we have the iron and um, it's attached to a rope and that's the reading of tension T1, which is also what the scale is reading, right? Because it all the scale knows about is this rope right here, right? That's all it knows about. It doesn't know what's happening below it. 
Um, and then I'm going to think about all the forces acting on the iron. Well, the iron also feels the force of gravity, which is M2 times G, right? Just its weight. Oh, okay, so then I'm right, Diego. So that's good. Um, and also, there's another contact force, right, which is the buoyancy force acting on the iron. So I'm going to go ahead and call that B sub I for iron. And the sum of forces equal to zero. This is a static problem. Um, I should really just be looking at sum of forces in the Y. There's nothing else. Those equal zero. And so I have buoyancy force on the iron plus T1 minus M2G equals to zero. Just from that first equation. And um, I just need to ins remember what I'm solving for, which is T1. And that's equal to M2G minus buoyancy force from iron. So the buoyancy force from the iron is just the density of the iron. Oh, sorry. I'm still wrong. Hold on. This is the general equation for buoyancy force. It's the density of the fluid. Well, it's submerged in oil. So the fluid it's submerged in is density one. The volume displaced, well, the volume displaced because it's completely submerged. So this is, remember, what I always ask myself. Um, the most the volume displaced can be is the volume of the object. And that's the case when it's completely submerged. Um, in this case, the volume of the object is just the volume of the iron. Well, the volume of the iron isn't a known, so I'm going to go back to density, which is mass divided by volume. Wait, hold on, I can't see what you're saying, Patrick. Oh. Um, the density of the iron is the mass of the iron divided by the volume of the iron. So I can write the volume of the iron as mass of the iron divided by density of iron. Uh, but in terms of what they gave me, uh, dense mass of iron is M2, density of iron is rho 2. So uh, in this volume displaced, which is the volume of the object, I'm replacing it with this. So that's what I'll do. Um, this is M2 over rho 2 all times G. And then I'll put that whole thing into my equation, you know, right here for buoyancy of iron. And I'll get T1 equals to M2G minus M2G rho 1 over rho 2. Or, you know, this can reduce a little bit, I guess, M2G times 1 minus rho 1 over rho 2. And let me just check against my answers in here. And that's exactly what I have. Okay, so that's good. For T1. So that should be the answer for T1. Any questions on that? So um, I feel like this next part is probably a little bit harder. I'm going to cut out this picture, bring it to the next page. But it's still just thinking about uh, forces, right? Uh, forces acting on effectively the scale underneath now. So. Uh, first thing I'll think about is um, what's going on with the oil. I know this sounds weird, but um, thinking about the oil as a body, um, I'd just like to say that um, what forces is it feeling? Well, it's sitting on top of the beaker, so it feels a normal force um, from resting on the beaker. It also feels some X forces, okay, but my argument is that they're going to be equal and opposite and they're not contributing to what the scale is reading. Um, but the oil itself feels a normal force from resting on top of the, the actual glass beaker. Um, in addition, it also feels the force of gravity, M1 times G, the M1 is the mass of the oil. But it also feels the equal and opposite force, 
the buoyancy force on the iron. So let me just go back a page just to remind you, um, the buoyancy force on the iron was a force from the surrounding fluid, a contact force. Therefore, by Newton's third law, the equal and opposite force acts on the surrounding fluid. So in the Y, those are the forces acting on the oil. And then now I can think about the sum of forces equals zero still. And I'm gonna solve for the normal force because that's actually gonna be relevant to what's on the scale. It's not 100% what it is, but that's what's on the scale. Normal force is gonna be M1G plus buoyancy force on the iron and remember, the buoyancy force on the iron is a known here, so when it's necessary, I'll come back and find it. Um, after that, I'm going to think about what's happening on the actual glass beaker. So here's my beaker. And again, it might have some kind of forces in the X, but I'm not worried about those. I just want to think about the forces in the Y. So um, it's in contact with the oil above it and um, it exerts a normal force on the oil and so that equal and opposite force is going to be acting on the beaker. Similarly, it feels a normal force from where it's sitting on top of this scale right here, right? And um, whether you realize it or not, that normal force, and I'll call it normal force of the scale, is T2. It's just what the scale is reading. And that points upward. I hope this all makes sense to you guys. Um, in addition, it feels the effects of gravity because it has a mass. Um, it's mass of the beaker times G. The sum of forces in the Y equal to zero here. And that tells me that the normal force S, which happens to be equal to the tension I'm solving for, is equal to the normal force on the beaker plus the mass or the weight of the beaker. And so at this point, um, I'm going to plug in NB, which is M1G plus the buoyancy force from iron into that equation. So I'm just inputting this into here, which is this. And then I'm going to input uh, whatever the buoyancy force of iron was, which I've forgotten. So let me go back. Well, here it is. Here's the buoyancy force of iron. I put it up here. And so T, T2 will equal M1G plus the buoyancy force of iron, which in terms of knowns is M2G rho 1 over rho 2 plus mass of beaker times G. And so that should be the answer from tension two. So everything here has just been a Newton's law analysis. So you see why everything that we're doing really just kind of works off of everything else. You see what I mean? Like we're still just doing some of forces here. Newton's third law, you know, is it moving, not moving, that kind of stuff, but with buoyancy forces now. Do you guys have any questions on this? You can use your yes nos. <laughs> yeah, because you know fluids are just air too. It's all crazy. <laughs> they're just, but they're masses. They're point particles. Sorry, my phone was making noise. I'm back. It's a tall me. Very funny. Okay, good, Dustin. Yeah, we're still, I'm telling you, this is still just a forces exam that we're working on. Uh, T1 is indirectly included in there, Diego, uh, because at some point, 
I include the buoyancy force, which is indirectly related to T1. Two C, two C, yeah. Let me find. Um, no, T1's a little bit different though, right? Because T1 is including the weight of the iron and the buoyancy force. I mean, maybe there's a way to solve it that way, Diego. I don't actually know. Do you know what I mean? This is the way that's natural to me. I feel like there's a lot of ways to solve this. So 2C, 2D. Okay. T1 is in there indirectly. All right. So let me, let me look at 2C and 2D. I might have to go through the rest of them though, you guys, because um, I got to look at the problem. You know what I mean? Believe us, it's one gram per centimeter cubed or 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. You know what I mean? Those are different units. If it's one, it's one gram per centimeter cubed. All right, so this one says the weight of a rectangular block of low density, density material is blank. So here's your block. Let's give it a mass. We know the density of it is low, whatever that's going to mean here. And Mg is unknown. With a thin string, the center of the horizontal bottom face of the block is tied. God, that's a lot of words. With a thin string, the center of the bottom, oh, okay, it's tied from underneath, okay, to the bottom of a beaker, and it's partially filled with water. When 25% of the block's volume is submerged, so it's a block, that's nice of them. So uh, when 25% of the volume so it is submerged, so right now, 25% of the volume is submerged. And this is water. The tension in the string, T equals to some known value. Find the buoyancy force on the block. So I feel like this is gonna be a force body diagram again too. So on the block, mass M, currently in this configuration, you'll have a buoyancy force the weight of the object and the tension force. So again, since nothing is moving, sum of forces in the y equals zero. And uh, what am I solving for? Yeah, B is gonna be equal to T plus Mg. Uh, you know the tension in the string <clears throat> and you know Mg, so that, that should be it. Um, just the addition of those two. It's actually nothing more fancy than that. You're just going to add it. T is known and Mg is known. So that's actually super simple. All right. So that's nice. Uh, part B. Uh, maybe that's why you guys wanted me to do C and D. Right. Part B says, I got to go through it, you guys. Oil of density 800. Okay. So oil, which we know the density of oil, is added to the system forming a layer above the water and surrounding the block. It exerts forces on all four sides of that block that the oil touches. What are the directions of the forces? Fine, so you're adding oil. Let's see, maybe if you'll completely submerged. And yeah, the forces are gonna be this way, acting on the side. Uh, what happens to the string tension as the oil is added? It increases because there's more of a buoyancy force. So for C, it increases because there's more of a buoyancy force. I spelled that wrong. In the very simple way of thinking about it, uh, more volume of fluid
is displaced. So you can say there's more buoyancy force acting. So um, what that means is that on the mass, this gets bigger. Gravity doesn't change. So that means to keep the sum of forces zero, T has to get bigger too. So in the most simple way you think about it that way, it's a little bit weird because they're, they're telling you before in that step that the forces act horizontally. Do you know what I mean? And you're like, well, how can that create a bigger buoyancy force this way? Isn't that weird? Um, and part of the answer is that you have to think about is that as you're adding oil on top of the water, that the pressure is increasing. So if I think about the pressure now acting at the bottom, maybe I'll make it a different color. If I think about the pressure here along this line right here, as I've added the oil, pressure here, oops, pressure is higher after or larger after oil is added which means that the force acting on the bottom surface is also larger. So it actually makes a larger buoyancy force, even though it seems as if the forces are only acting horizontally, it does affect the layers underneath. And so uh, they're trying to ask you to explain in part C why that happens. Okay. Part D says um, this, the spring the string breaks when the tension reaches a certain value. So there's a T max that's known. At this moment, 25% of the block's volume is still below the water line. Okay, so you're still saying it's the same configuration as before. You're just trying to find how much volume, what additional fraction of the block's volume is below the top surface of the oil. Okay, so um, with the addition of the oil, we have this picture right here. And so we have buoyancy force bigger, I'll just call it B sub B equals MG. And um, T bigger, I'm actually gonna allow it to become the maximum value. So in a sense, I've maxed out what the tension can be right before it breaks. And it wants to know, you know, how does that relate to the buoyancy force by saying what percentage of oil is actually, or volume is submerged in the oil. So uh, the buoyancy force is in fact bigger and a buoyancy force sub B is actually equal to the buoyancy force on the water plus the buoyancy force on the oil. It can be written into two bits. The buoyancy force on the water is the same as before. Um, so here, yeah, I believe it should just be exactly the same. I'm going to call this buoyancy force of the water right here because it's the density of the fluid volume displaced times G. That's the density of the water. Uh, and if it's 25% or one fourth the volume of the object submerged in it, then nothing has changed from this first case to another. So this is just your answer to part A that you're inserting here, uh, plus the buoyancy force of the oil. That will be the density of the oil. This is how much volume is displaced times G. This is kind of what you want to know. Um, the ratio of this volume displaced to the actual volume of the object is of interest here. So I'm going to solve for, and I'll circle it again, this volume displaced. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that question. The oil pushes down on the water and the water pushes back up on the block. Well, the pressure becomes larger. And so the force from the pressure becomes larger on the bottom of the surface there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the water does kind of, um, the water does push, it's always been pushing on the block. It just pushes more when the oil's on top of it. And so maybe that is the way to think about it. is that to keep the sum of forces zero, sorry, I <laughs> didn't do that. To keep the sum of forces zero, the more the oil pushes on the water, it is pushing back up. And so it creates more of a force. But I think about it in terms of layers of pressure, you're just really increasing the pressure by adding oil on top of it, by more fluid sitting on top of it.
Okay, so um, ich, I feel like I need to copy all this and bring it to the next page, so I will. Okay, so um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, say my part. My answer from part A was T plus mg. That's what that was called. So uh, here on the left hand side, I'm gonna have T plus mg plus density of oil volume displaced times g equals mg plus t max. I can see those mgs cancel out right away. And um, I'm going to go ahead and bring this t over here and t max minus the tension from, this is the one from part A that they gave you, will be equal to the density of the oil, the volume displaced times g. And at this point, to solve for volume displaced, I'm just going to be dividing by a density of the oil times g and density of the oil was in fact given to you right yes density of oil was given 800 kilograms per meter cubed um, and so it wants a fraction though this is the volume displaced but it actually wants the volume displaced divided by the total volume of the object itself so it's going to take a little bit more work because we have to find uh, what is the volume of the object? And um, that I believe you can get right from, let's see, your original reading from part A. So the buoyancy force from the water, as I told you guys, is equal to the density of water, the volume displaced times G, and in part A, this is one fourth the volume of the object. That's what they told you, 25% was submerged. And so I can actually solve, use that equation, T plus mg equals one fourth density of water volume of object times G to solve for the volume of the object. It's four T plus mg from part A divided by the density of the water times G. And when I plug that into this equation, that should give me a, per, a ratio, which I would then multiply by 100%. Right, so um, like for me, it, gave me, it should give me back 4.474, which I then multiply by 100%. Does that make sense, everyone? You guys want me to check my numbers? I can. 60 minus 14.5. This is 800 times G. This is 4 times 30. 1,000 times G. Sorry guys, sometimes I feel like I'm just talking to myself. It's funny how. Huh. What's 60 minus Okay, so that's right. Okay, any questions, you guys? All 41 of you? Questions, questions?
Okay. So um, I'm going to see you guys all, you know, make sure you're coming to recitation, you know, and make sure, please, please, please practice. Make sure you can make some good documents for me to scan up for the exam on Tuesday. Um, just so that's not an issue. It's a brave new world we're in. So please practice. Make sure you've got it dialed in. Figure out whatever you have to do. Um, meanwhile, um, yeah. Have a good weekend and I'll see you guys all on Monday and Tuesday. I'm going to go ahead and end this recording since nobody's asking any questions.